So our primary uh, passage this morning is going to be Genesis 22. We're going to do a little bit of page turning here. So um, that's just going to be the nature of this series as we kind of look at some of these uh, theological points um, in, in this series, Jesus, the true and better. So I want to start off by asking you a question. Have you ever found yourself to be tested? Tested. Tested by God. Maybe you're driving down the road, minding your own business, and suddenly a cat wanders right out in front of you, right in your lane, right? And you think, Lord, this is a test. Help me pass over this, right? <laughs> I wouldn't uh, speed up for a cat, but I would speed up for a squirrel. Can we all agree that squirrels need to go? They get into my wood pile and build these horrific nests, and uh, then they just run around and chirp at me like I'm intruding in their place. So, The scriptures make it clear to us in the epistle of James that God does, in fact, test us. Uh, he does not tempt us, but he does test us. James 1, 2 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And it goes on in verse 12 to say, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. We also know, again, from the, uh, this first chapter of James that God does not tempt us to sin, but rather he tests us. And these tests have both a, a formative uh, kind of aspect to us and a revealing uh, aspect. There's sort of two impacts that they have. Tests reveal our faith and the condition of it, such as it is, but it also helps develop and form our faith. A way of thinking about that is if uh, maybe you go to the gym, or at least you've seen people at the gym, you know what happens at the gym. You're not going there, but you know. And somebody gets on the bench press, and they start, they start pushing the bar. And it doesn't take long to realize, okay, this is how strong I am or how strong I'm not, right? It reveals something to you. At the same time, the more reps you do and the more resistance you put on, the stronger you get. And tests have this same way of impacting us. They reveal our measure of faith, but they also strengthen our faith. Okay, so what might a test look like other than the silly cat scenario there? Uh, it could be an enticing opportunity, maybe a new job or a different responsibility in your vocation. Maybe it's a new relationship, but it requires some kind of a compromise from you on your faith or in your morality. That's a test. Or maybe you've lost something or you've lost someone and it causes you to question the goodness of God. Is God good? Why would he take this away from me? I, I would simply ask you the question, uh, is God only good when we get what we want? Or maybe there's something that's happened, a, a disappointment of some kind in something or, or someone, and it causes you to sort of lose your spiritual bearings a little bit. And very often when it's in this realm, I think what is revealed is that sometimes we lean too heavily upon our man-made moorings and not on God himself. And Genesis 22, we find with Abraham and with his son Isaac, one of the greatest tests a person could ever encounter. Genesis 22, 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, listen to this, by the way, listen. Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife, and the two of them went on together. Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Father, 
Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abram answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. No kidding, right? Listening, listening to this interruption. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over, took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Okay, let's get this out of the way first. This is a tough story, right? If we're honest with this, if we're honest about our own human emotions, as we read this story and we see what's being asked here, or rather even commanded, we have to say, this is awkward. I mean, it's really awful that God would say, I want you to kill your son. That's tough. I mean, some of us are so familiar with this story that we're accustomed to this. We know the ending. But that is an incredibly difficult reality that is here. It makes us cringe. It is meant to make us cringe. This test is brutal just on the normal plane of a human uh, parent-child relationship, right? It's tough right there. But we could say that this command and this test has an additional layer of difficulty because uh, for Abraham, in light of God's promise to him and the circumstances surrounding it. In other words, and if you have your notes, pull those out, we'll follow along here. And I'll warn you up front, the first five points will take a certain amount of time, the last five will go lightning fast. Certain amount of time. That's preacher talk right there. It'll be a certain amount of time. So first of all, Isaac was the child of promise. Uh, we know this. We've seen this in Genesis 12, right? I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. But then years go by, and decades go by, and there is no child. There is no son. There is no one through whom his line would be perpetuated. And so we, we almost sense this moment of insecurity in Abraham. In chapter 15, it says, The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, and I think it could almost say, and Abram popped off, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son who is of your own flesh and blood, will be your heir. And then in one last uh, passage here, in chapter 21, verse 1, we see that the Lord makes good on his promise. The Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. Now, Isaac and Sarah certainly loved this child just by virtue of the fact that this is their kid. This is the one that God had given them. So there's love there just because of that. But also, 
He is the means by which God is going to keep his covenant with Abram and Sarah. That's their hope. That's their expectation. He is this promised one, one through whom all of their descendants would come. Add another little wrinkle to this. These guys are old. Abraham is, do you know? How old is he? When Isaac is born, how old is Abraham? 100. 100. I'm 46. If we have another child, I'm not going to take it very well. I can't even sit crisscross applesauce right now. I don't need another little one. Sarah's 90. So Abraham has already questioned God and his ability to keep and, and make good on his covenant promise. But then to lose the very means by which God had delivered this promise... And not just to lose it, but to actively take it out? This is as difficult as a test gets. Uh, I want to draw your attention to one other thing, too. Maybe you picked up on it. Uh, through this passage, through Genesis 22, as we read, we ran into a phrase three times. Did you catch the phrase? Your son, your one and only son. Three times that phrase, that same phrase is used and repeated through that passage. Repetition is the volume knob of Scripture. It is the author's way of saying, pay attention to this. So Isaac is the child of promise. The son, the one and only son. Secondly, Isaac's birth, we would say, is supernatural. I think it's fair to say that. Uh, in Genesis 17, if you'll turn there, in verse 15, God said to Abram, as for Sarai, your wife, you're no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of the nations. Kings of people will come from her. Abram fell down. He laughed and he said to himself, will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. Then God said, yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. Now, I want to talk about sort of the ages of some of the patriarchs in the scripture. Sometimes it's a little troubling when we're reading along and we come across some of these ages if we're meant to interpret them literally, okay? And I just lay that out there as a question. Adam, 930 years old. 930. Seth, 912. Enoch, one of the, I have a lot of questions about Enoch. It says he lived 365 years and then he was no more. Why? God took him. God's like, nah, he's mine. That's, that'd be a great way to go. Just skip death altogether. Just teleport home. Then we have Methuselah, 969 years old. Oldest man we're aware of in the scriptures. And that's before Advil, right? <laughs> 969, how did that feel? Terah, Abraham's father, 205 years old. So we're getting a declining actuary table here. So on the one hand, I want you to ask this question. If these are the ages and we're to take them literally then at 100 years old, isn't Abraham just middle-aged? Or even younger? So I think it's a reasonable question in light of what we find in the scriptures. But we're reminded that Abraham laughed. It was so incredulous to him that he fell face down and he laughed. In other words, it's going to take a miracle. A miracle for a child to be born to that old gal, 90 years old, and to this old guy at 100, right? And that's exactly what God did. He did a miracle. And then thirdly here, Isaac, we see, was willing to be a sacrifice. This is back to Genesis 22. And I, I got to be honest here, um, his willingness to be a sacrifice isn't explicitly told to us in the text. This is some inference that I'm making here. Nevertheless, I, I think the inference is warranted. So in chapter 22, verse 9, it said, When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. 
he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Abram was how old when Isaac was born? 100 years old. How much time has passed? Well, we don't know. But if we connect a few dots here and think about how old is Isaac? He's at least old enough to put upon his back a load of firewood large enough or enough wood to be put on an altar to consume a human sacrifice. That's a fair bit of firewood. Yeah, I think so. And not only that, but he has to carry it up a mountain. So Isaac is what, 16, 18, 20, maybe more? And the older he gets and the stronger he gets, the older Abraham gets and the weaker he gets. At least that's how it works at home around our ping pong table. As the kids get older, they get better. Dad gets a little worse, although I've only lost one game to any of my children ever, and I won't even tell you to who. So I, anyways, I, I'm just going to say Isaac is at least old enough and strong enough to resist an aged father who's over 100 years old who is tying him up. And while the emphasis of this passage, I think, is really on Abraham and his faith, there sure seems to be an undeniable aspect of Isaac's submission and obedience to his father. Fourthly, Isaac's father believed that God could raise the dead. Now, as we read through the passage here uh, in Genesis, you know, we, we kind of get a bit of his reasoning, of Abraham's reasoning. The fire, are here, the fire is here, the wood is here, Isaac said, but where's the lamb? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And remember what he told the servant, right? We're going to go over here and worship, and then we, we are going to come back. So he has every confidence, he has every faith that God is going to deliver them. In the Genesis passage, it seems to be that his, his confidence is that God will provide for them a ram. But the author of Hebrews has another element to add to this. In Hebrews eleven seventeen, 17, it says, By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. So these two things are at work in Abraham, but the author of Hebrews makes it explicit that one of these is that he believed that God really could raise the dead. And there's something else here that's absolutely fascinating to me in the Genesis 22 passage. There's a phrase there. There's this Old Testament phrase that is just loaded, and it's easy to skip it or miss it, but the phrase is, the angel of the Lord. And I want to draw your attention to that because that is a significant phrase. When we read the Old Testament and we find a phrase, an angel of the Lord, it means just what it says. An angel, one of many, of whom there are very many, right? But when we run into this phrase, the angel of the Lord, this is the way the Old Testament refers to the pre-incarnate Christ, the eternal Son the angel of the Lord. The first time this appearance occurs is actually in Genesis 16, in the story with Hagar, when she runs away from Sarah. And I'll let you research that on your own and study that. But you can see her interaction with the angel of the Lord and even the name that she confers upon this angel as a characteristic of God. So I just think that's absolutely fascinating. So with that in mind, let's read this uh, section in, in uh, chapter 22 again, verse 9. It says, When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy. He said, do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me 
your son, your only son. This isn't just an angel, one of many. This is the angel of the Lord. This is the pre-incarnate Christ. This is God the Son. We can't quite say that this is Jesus, uh, and here's the reason why. He has not yet given, uh, been given birth. He has not been birthed by Mary. He has not taken on humanity to his deity. She hasn't even given him the name Jesus yet. This is the eternal son prior to incarnation. And I think in this passage, we can also see sort of the identification with God and yet even the distinction from the Father. And we see it again in verse 15. The angel of the Lord called out to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars, and so on and so forth. So what we see here is Abraham ready to sacrifice his son, his only son, whom he loves. And the one who interrupts him is God's son, his only son, whom he loves. God the son interrupts this sacrifice because he knows he will be the true and greater sacrifice. Jesus is the true and greater Isaac. And then we get our fifth point here. Through Isaac, all the nations will be blessed. This covenant promise that God made with Abraham, still intact. Isaac will be the father of Jacob. Jacob will be the father of 12 sons, including Judah. And from this line, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Judah, we eventually have Jesus, the one through whom all of the nations are blessed. And so Abraham and his, his son Isaac, nations are blessed through them because they're a really good family, really good guys, because they have a really good Savior. From them comes a really good Savior. So Jesus is the true and better Isaac. Well, how is that, you might ask? And now we're going to fly, so hang in there. We see that Jesus was also a child of promise. And Isaiah 9, For to us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And the passage goes on from there. We see that Jesus' birth was supernatural, right? This time, instead of an old codger and his old bag wife, right? Instead of these old folks, we have a young woman, not yet married, a virgin, her fiancé. And to them, the angel says, you have found favor with God, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call his name Jesus. And then we see Jesus, also a willing sacrifice. For Abraham, it was his willingness to sacrifice his son that showed his love for God. God's willingness to sacrifice his son, his one and only son, shows his great love for us. And, and something I think that's really important about the sacrifice of Christ, too, is to recognize that it is a willing sacrifice. He gives of himself. Uh, there are some modern skeptics, including Richard Dawkins and Bart Ehrman, two guys who would say, we don't really like this sacrificial story. This is divine child abuse. That cannot be said here because Jesus gives himself. He says in the Gospel of John, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I've received from my Father. And then we see that Jesus' Father actually raised him from the dead. Right? Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. Jesus knew that he would raise the dead. And he did raise the dead. Peter makes this declaration uh, to the people in Jerusalem, the crowd in Jerusalem, uh, when he says, This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. I want you to think about that last phrase. It was impossible. It was impossible for death to keep its hold on Jesus. 
I don't think we contemplate the resurrection that, much, that way very often. I think we think about what a great miracle. It's incredible. Jesus conquered death. You know, maybe didn't see that coming. That's against all odds. When in fact the scripture says, no, no, it was impossible. It was impossible for death to hold on to Christ. That was impossible. And finally, through Jesus, all nations will be blessed. And this is what Paul teaches in Galatians. He reminds us of just the totality of Scripture telling one story. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. And he announced the gospel in advance to Abraham, all nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Jesus is the true and better Isaac. There is a literary um, word uh, called denouement. It looks like denouement. If you see it spelled out, I should have probably typed it out and given you a visual. How many of you have heard of this word denouement before? Cool, about a dozen of you. Uh, funny, I would thought, I'm going to use this word this Sunday, and then I'm reading Les Mis, and wouldn't you know it, I actually ran across that word in a, written, you know, in a, in a novel, in a bit of fiction. You never run across this word. But anyways, denouement. And it's French for, literally, the untying of something. Uh, so let me interrupt this for a second here. Uh, you know by now I love to fly fish, and my preferred way of catching fish by fly is a nice dry fly, Right? There's something about putting a dry fly on the stream, mending your line, and just watching that little speck just go down the river, and then all of a sudden, the ripple and the take. That is intoxicating for me. I love that. And then that magic little, you know, shake on the end of your rod. Anyways, that's how I prefer to catch fish, but, you know, you've got to catch them how, on what they're, what they're taking. So one of the ways up here that really works is what's called beading. Has anybody ever heard of that? Beading. Here's what it looks like. I want you to imagine. So you've got your fly line, which is a floating line. And now you have that long, um, I guess we'll just call it, it's not fly line. It's not the heavy floating stuff. It's sort of your tippet and, and all the rest. At the end of it, you've got a hook. An inch and a half above that, you have um, a bead, a little plastic bead. And then maybe 16 inches above that, you've got a, a split shot or two, depending on how far down in the water column you need to get and how fast the water's moving. And then above that, you have another thing which people who make fun of fly fishing call it a bobber. It's not a bobber. I'm going to call it a strike indicator because I can't bring myself to say the other one. It makes me sad. But as you think about this whole setup here, I've got a strike indicator. I've got split shot. I've got a bead. And then I've got a hook. Four points of articulation. And this line is going through the air. And you're trying to just drop it down and same thing, fish it through the current. And then on your back cast, it hits a branch. And if you want to think about four points of articulation while this line is slinging through the air, it ties a knot that is amazing, really difficult to get undone too. It just wraps around itself in all kinds of, and when it does it, you think, how am I going to untangle it? How am I going to unravel this? This is going to take me 10, 15 minutes. It's always tempting to go, cut, next. <laughs> but there's a lot of money sitting on that line. So you work on it. And when you finally get it all untangled and all the points and you get it to lay out smoothly again in the water, that is a picture of denouement. It is what happens in a story, in a novel, or in a movie, or in a play, when all of the plot points resolve. It's that thing that untangles all of the plot uh, conflict and all of the things throughout the story such that now it is neat and clean and lays down as it should. Jesus is the denouement of the scriptures. Not just of the scripture's story, but of the real life redemption story that God is authoring and by his grace writing us into. Jesus is the true and the better Isaac. Let's pray. Father, we know our lives to be tangled, knotted, wrapped around itself. We know ourselves at our heart to be sinners. We know, Lord, that none of us could stand before a holy God. 
Whether we know this by the scripture's teaching or just in our heart of hearts, we know this to be true. And yet by your grace and your mercy, Lord, you gave your son, your son, your one and only son, whom you loved. You gave him as a sacrifice for us. We see the sacrifice of Isaac and cringe and thank God that it didn't happen. But we see the sacrifice of Jesus and we rejoice and we say, thank you, Lord, that it did happen. For in him, we are healed. In him, we are forgiven. In him, our sin is paid for. And in him, we will be resurrected to be with the Father because he has justified us to him. Thank you for the sacrifice that you made, Lord. Jesus, thank you for your willingness to go to the cross for me and for all those who are here. We pray this in his strong name. Amen.